I'm going to read from Srimad Bhagavatam from the first canto and this is a verse chapter 4 uh, describing about Sukadeva Goswami this is text number 4 chapter 4 text 4 of the first canto Tashya Putro Mahayogi Tashya Putro Mahayogi Samadrin Nirvikaupaka Alert. 
either in sense enjoyment or in self-realization. The conditioned soul is absorbed in matter, whereas the liberated soul is completely indifferent to matter. This indifference is explained in the next verse. Okay? Om Ajnana Timirandasya
have no experience of that. It's much easier to be attached to a person than to be attached to something which is impersonal. Difficult to develop feeling, but well, we can't. On the impersonal, the, on the impersonal platform, there should be no feelings. There's only the oneness. That it's all one. That you are. Tattvamasi, Shankaracharya gave a lot of importance. He put the emphasis on on this kind of aphorism. Tattvamasi, that sarvam kaubidam brahma. These are all the impersonal statements which were promoted by Shankaracharya. So, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu exposed these defects and Lord Chaitanya, of course, uh, he defeated this impersonalism and this tendency towards Nirvishesha and Shunyavadi by preaching well, what we call Gauravani the message of Lord Chaitanya. And that message of Lord Chaitanya, of course, was the chanting of the holy name, despite the Sankirtan movement. So it's the chanting of the holy names which actually takes away this impersonalism. But sometimes we do find also that those who are on the monist path may also chant the holy name. They may also chant the name of the Lord. They may also worship Radha and Krishna, and they may also read Bhagavad Gita, but their intention is to become one. That we're doing these things because they are the means to our perfection. And their idea is that eventually we're going to give this up. But a devotee, one who is personal, he wants to engage eternally in the service of the Lord. The devotee is engaged in sanatan dharma. We talk about eternal religion. We want to continue to continue to go on and serve Krishna. We serve Krishna here in this world, and when we go to the spiritual world, we will continue to serve there. So Sukadeva Goswami, he was fixed, he was attached, he was concentrating on this monistic path. Similarly, the four Kumaras, they were also monists, but they also became devotees. And Prabhupada says, actually, he said, we, we, we find the impersonalists, the monists becoming devotees, but there's no example of devotees becoming impersonalists. You may say, no, I know somebody, he, he was with us and then he went to the, the impersonal. Then probably he wasn't a devotee at all. <laughs> but you, you don't become a devotee just by being here. We have to have the mood of a devotee. We have to have the, the, the heart, the, the feelings of the heart that we want to render service to Lord Krishna. So, a devotee is different from the conditioned soul. In the first part, Srila Prabhupada is talking about how, what is, it? he's referring to that verse in the Bhagavad Gita, Yanisha Sarva Bhutana. Yeah, what is night for the conditioned souls is a time of awakening for the self realized souls. And what is time of, uh, what is night for the introspective sage is the time of awakening. For the conditions of this. Yeah, we there's a big difference between the life of the devotee and the life of the conditioned souls. What enlivens a devotee, you know, it may be horrible for the non-devotee, the conditioned souls, you know. We for the, as devotees, we are happy the thought of uh, you know Mongol RT, early morning program, it's very Oh, it must be so nice to go to a Mongol RT 4.30 in the morning in the temple and see the deities and sing the glories of the Lord and then chant His holy name and spend the whole morning in spiritual activities. But to materialistic people, it sounds terrible. You know, they're thinking, what? <laughs> I can't, they, they cannot imagine. 
So, they have a, and, and then similarly, what enlivens the materialist, you know, their idea of something, you know, to go the whole night to the club and drinking or gambling and meat, and all horrible, sinful activities. And for a devotee, it's just the most awful, terrible things. But for the materialistic people, they're thinking, wonderful, this is, you know, our, our, how we get our pleasure, our life. So there's a different vision. But sometimes the activities may be the same. The conditioned soul and the liberated soul, they may be engaged in the same activities. For example, you, you know, you may be working somewhere, and you're, so you're working, and some other condition materialistic person is working also in the same office, the same job. But there's a big difference in the consciousness. One is a liberating soul, and one is a conditioned soul. They're doing the same work, the same activities. They drive the car to work, go to the office, and they do their job. And it seems like they're doing the same activities as anybody else. But actually they're liberating souls because they do everything as a service for Krishna. They don't do it for simply just for their own sense gratification, but they do it in consciousness of Krishna. They, but the conditioned soul, he's doing the same work in consciousness simply of the body and his bodily needs. The devotee is performing the activities in relation to Krishna. He's thinking my service to Krishna. And the materialist is thinking my body for my pleasure. Srila <coughs> Prabhupada gives an example about the mother who was not well educated. And she had a young child who wanted to get a good education. So the child and the mother arranged a tutor to come and give classes to her child. And the tutor was teaching the child mathematics. And they were doing some algebra, A plus B equals C. And the mother was watching, and then she became upset. And she started to chastise the teacher. That I brought you here to teach my son. Why are you still teaching him ABC? My son has already been studying 10 years at school. He already knows ABC. Why are you teaching him this? But, but the teacher said, no, no, I'm not teaching ABC. This is algebra. A plus B is, is mathematics. It's, I'm not teaching him ABC. The mother cannot understand, you see. She's thinking this is just ABC. They, she cannot see the difference. And similarly, people may see the activities of a devotee and they may think, well, he's just the same as me, he does the same work I do. What is the difference between him and me? There's no difference. Why do you think he's a liberated soul? But the difference is in consciousness, that the devotee performs activities in the consciousness as being a servant of Krishna. He does not think the activities are being performed simply for his own pleasure or for his own material gain, but he considers it to be his duty in relation to Krishna. Everyone has some duty to perform. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna wanted to give up his duty. But Lord Krishna instructed him this is not proper. You should perform your duty. But perform the duty without attachment. And in this way, then you will no longer have to worry about the reactions from the activities. It becomes karma yoga. When we perform our duty with detachment, this is karma yoga. Arjuna was thinking, let me become a beggar, let me go back. But Krishna says, that's not your nature. You have to act according to your nature. 
Arjuna is a Kshatriya from a royal family. How could he go and simply beg? Not his position. Rather, it was his duty, his nature, to fight and to take part in the battle. So in the same way, we also have to perform duty. We have our material duties and our spiritual duties. Material duties according to our situation in Varnas, in ashrams. Families, and we have children, we have to recognize responsibilities. These things are important, we cannot neglect. At the same time, we have also spiritual duties. Now, at, we may question, at what stage can we give up the material to take up spiritual duties? Because Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that we should give up all material religion and simply surrender to Him. So at what stage are we qualified to give up all of these material duties when we are liberated. Without being a liberated soul, we're not qualified to give up our material duties. First of all, we have to become a liberated soul. What does that mean? Sometimes people think liberated soul means you should have four arms. Well, if we have to wait till we have four arms, we will never. <laughs> Rather, liberation means Liberation, a jivan mukta, a liberated soul, is one who uses the body, mind and words in the service of Krishna. So if we're able to fully dedicate the body, mind and words in the service of Krishna, then we can give up all our jivan. Sukadeva Goswami was that kind of person. And you can see, it's described here, that his appearance, he appears like a, he appeared to be like a, an ignorant person. He was appearing at the time of the speaking of the Srimad Bhagavatam, he appeared naked, with hair disheveled, and body, body was dirty, he appeared almost like a madman. He was actually Avadut. He's Avadut, just as Sri Shabdi was Avadut. And his Lord Nichananda was Avadut. Sukadeva also is Avadut. Avadut means he does not belong to any of the ashrams. He's not a, he was a brahmachari, but he's not considered a brahmachari. He wasn't a grihasta, he wasn't a vanaprasta, he wasn't a sannyasi. He didn't follow Varnashra. He didn't follow because he was above all of that. He was fixed on, on the transcendental platform. As described here, he, he was always absorbed, concentrated in monism, concentrated in that Brahman, in the supreme within. <coughs> So he had nothing to do with the material world. He didn't wait for his father to give him the sacred thread. Immediately he left me. So he was a liberated soul. And that's why when he speaks Srimad Bhagavatam, then it has very powerful as effect. Sometimes people say, yeah, I want somebody like Sukadeva Goswami to speak Sri Bhagavatam. But Sukadeva Goswami, he speaks to people like Maharaj Pariksit. So if you want to hear from somebody like Sukadeva Goswami, you have to become like Maharaj Pariksit. Maharaj Pariksit gave up everything to go and hear Srimad Bhagavatam. He left the home. He took off his royal robes and he is ready to die. He was very serious. He gave up even 
eating and sleeping. He did not even drink water for seven days in preparation for leaving his body. That is the mood we have to have to actually hear Srimad Bhagavatam. We have to take it very seriously. The Sukadeva Goswami, he is the right person to speak Srimad Bhagavatam. Because he is deep, he is completely free from all material affinity. He's the liberated soul. So Sukadeva Goswami, uh, we said he's our authority in this matter. He had heard Srimad Bhagavatam from his father and therefore he was able to repeat as he had heard from Vyasadeva. We want, we want to understand the Vedic literatures. We also have to hear through the proper channels, through the disciplic succession. Just as Srila Vyasadeva heard also, Srila, we know in Srimad Bhagavatam it's described how Vyasadeva was instructed by Narada Muni. And Narada Muni, he was instructed by his father, Lord Brahma. And Lord Brahma, he got his instruction from Lord Krishna. So this is a disciplic succession. In the same way, we want to understand the Srimad Bhagavatam through this line of disciplic succession. And the, the results of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, when we hear properly, the result will be that we will also become like Sukadeva Goswami. We will also, as it's described here, he became indifferent to material flesh. He's not attached to any kind of pleasure of the material world. So, this is, of course, not an easy thing to achieve, but it is possible when we follow the proper procedure. Regular, what is that procedure? We have to execute sadhana bhakti regularly, hearing, chanting, taking part in Krishna consciousness. We don't have to change our ashram or change, we don't have to become like Sukadeva Goswami. We don't have to become a madman. Rather, we have to remain in our position. Stani stita shruti gatam tanpan manobir ye prayaso jita jito Yeah, remain in your position same time hear about Krishna in the association of devotees. And in this way Krishna becomes conquered. Although Krishna is never conquered, he is conquered by the pure love of his devotees. Those devotees who become attached, who become indifferent to all <coughs> kinds of pleasure of the material world. How do we how do we become indifferent to the pleasures of the material world simply by becoming interested in Krishna. The more we are interested in Krishna, the less we are interested in Maya. It's like the tug of war. Did you have tug of war when you were young? Yeah. When you get on one rope, you know, and the, the two teams and they're pulling. One team's trying to pull the other. So Maya's on one end and Krishna's on the other. Who's going to win? Well, it depends. If we, you know, if we help Maya, you know, we can go to Maya. We, we can choose. If we want Maya, Maya is there. We can take Maya. We have that free will. We are the marginal potency of the Lord. Krishna has given us that independence to choose which way we want to go. Just like there's that famous book, Alice in Wonderland. And when Alice came into the Wonderland, then she didn't know. So she asked someone, which way do I go from here? She just came in, just entered into the Wonderland. And she asked it, one man, she asked the person, who was it, the rabbit? Where do I go from here? So he said to her, where do you want to go? 
And she said, well, I don't really know. So he said, well, it doesn't matter which way you go, does it? If you don't know which way you want to go, it doesn't really matter which, but it does matter to us. We should know, it does matter. We, but we have to know which way we want to go. We, if we go to Maya, and you enter into the kingdom of Maya, then we're entering into the wheel, the, again, entering into samsar, birth and death, and all the miseries of material life. It's not a happy place. There are many troubles in the kingdom of Maya. But if we take shelter of Krishna, then Krishna, it, we can go back to our eternal home. Krishna is waiting for us to return there. He wants to bring us home. But we have to be ready. We have to be convinced that we really want to go. Sometimes Prabhupada says one, one of the, the, the most difficult or the, the biggest problem which his disciples had it was, was that they were not afraid enough of Maya. We were not afraid of Maya. That is dangerous. You know, just like children, if they want to play with fire, or they want to play with electricity, it's very dangerous. And similarly, if we play with Maya, if we're not afraid of Maya, then that's very dangerous for us. And we will, then we will see just how powerful Maya is, and how she binds, and how she quickly she can bewilder us. Lord Shiva wanted to understand how great is Maya. What is the potency of Maya? And at that time, the beautiful woman appeared in front of Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva became infatuated. He had never seen such beauty. And he began chasing after this woman. It was, of course, Mohini Murti. But Lord Shiva was racing. He was, even though his wife was there, he was infatuated by this woman. And this woman ran in different places where great sages and yogis were meditating. And they could all see Lord Shiva, how he was lusting after this beautiful woman. So in this way, the Lord taught Lord Shiva the greatest lesson. How powerful is my the force of illusion. That every one of us are liable to this illusion. If even great personalities like Lord Shiva, who was actually Dira, who was such a great soul that he would, could be undisturbed in many difficult situations. But even he became overwhelmed when the Lord appeared in that form this morning. So we have to be, we have to develop this uh, fear of maya. Maya meaning everything which is not in relation to Krishna. Whatever is not connected, what does not allow us to cultivate our Krishna consciousness, then we should immediately want to go away from that place. Give up that. <coughs> At the same time, we do want to use everything in Krishna's sense. We do like to take, to recognize that everything has some utility in the service of Krishna. Rupa Goswami tells us, Nirbanda Krishna Sambande, Yukta Vairagya Uchyati. Actual renunciation is to utilize everything in the service of Krishna. We don't want to just simply give up the material world. Rather, we want to use the material world in Krishna's sense. Just like when, when there is food, if you are hungry, then immediately you want to put the food in your mouth. In the same way, a devotee, he wants to use everything for Krishna. 
when he sees a nice person, he thinks, oh, this man or this woman, they're very talented, they're very cultured, they're very good people. You think, if only I can make them a devotee, somehow I can bring them to Krishna consciousness. This is the thinking of a devotee. So Sukadeva Goswami, he is that kind of person. He has hair, Srimad Bhagavatam, he has realized it. He is fully detached from the material pleasures of life. He simply wants to be engaged in devotional service. He's been wandering the world, but by the arrangement of the Lord, he has the opportunity to meet with Maharaj Pariksit. Just at that time, when Maharaj Pariksit had been cursed to die. Srila Prabhupada points out, he said that they never met before. Sukadeva Goswami had no interest to meet a person like Maharaj Pariksit. But when Maharaj Pariksit was retired from all of his worldly duties, then Sukadeva Goswami appeared. Then the arrangement was made. So Lord Krishna arranges for us to meet people which gives us the opportunity to cultivate our bhakti. By the mercy of Krishna, we get the association of devotees. By the mercy of the devotees, we get Krishna. We cannot get Krishna independently of the devotees. If we want to get Krishna, we have to know the devotees, we have to associate with the devotees. Krishna tells Uddhava, what if someone says he is my devotee, he is not really my devotee. But if he is a devotee of my devotee, then he is my devotee. Worship of Krishna's devotees is even more important than worship of Krishna. We not only worship Krishna, we must also worship Krishna's devotees. We worship the Tulsi tree, we worship Srila Prabhupada, we perform his Guru Puja. In this way we, wor we are worshipping those things in relation to Krishna. Aradhanam sarvesham Vishnu aradhanam param. Tasmat parataram devi tadiyanam samachar. Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu is supreme. But, Lord Shiva goes on, even greater than the worship of Lord Vishnu is the worship of those things in relation to Vishnu. The worship of the devotees. So that's why within our daily program, we also worship the founder Acharya. We, and by worshipping the founder Acharya, we're offering our respects to all of the Acharyas in the line of the Siplic succession. And of course we also worship Tulsi Mataji, the pure devotee, in the form of Tulsi tree. So these are important points to understand. We see Lord Krishna himself teaching his example, by example that whenever a Brahman would come to Dwarka, he would worship them. When Sudama came, Lord Krishna sat Sudama down and worshipped him and fed him and pleased him. When Rukmini sent a Brahmana with a message to, asking Krishna to come and save her, Krishna received that Brahmana so nicely. He fed him, he sat him down, he massaged his feet, he spoke nice words to him. So Lord Krishna was performing these activities simply for our benefit. Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord. He doesn't have to worship anyone, but he was doing it for the sake of teaching us by his own example. We have to learn from Krishna. We learn from... It's not that Krishna says one thing and he does another, but Krishna himself is teaching by his example. Okay, so we will stop now. We will ask if there are any questions or comments. We can talk <coughs> some more. If any of you would like to ask some question or comment.
what we've been speaking about, or some other matter, please. people do know that they're in Maya. Sometimes even we'll meet people that in the past maybe they had been associating with us, but for some reason or another they had stopped associating. And then after some time you may meet them again and they you say, how are you doing now? What's going on? I haven't seen you for a long time. What's happening? And they will say, oh, I'm in Maya. <laughs> I must be in Maya. <laughs> So often people do know they're in Maya, but they're just helpless to do anything about it. Because once you get into Maya, it's easy to get into Maya, it's not so easy to get out. <laughs> it's the nature of Maya, that she binds. This is, Maya means Krishna's energy. It's very powerful, very attractive. And you come into this, these cities like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, you see these huge buildings and the elaborate structures and all the different cars and things here. And so it appears to be, you know, very attractive. And people think, oh, life is very nice here. There's enjoyment, there's happiness here. We don't all, we can't always appreciate the temporary nature of the material world. You know, if we, if we were to understand just how temporary this life is, then we would maybe be thinking differently. Education is important. Well, yeah, we have to teach people to understand uh, what, when they're in Maya, what is Maya. Lord Chaitanya's mother and father, at one point, they didn't want Lord Chaitanya to go to school because Lord Chaitanya's older brother, Vishwarup, had become a sannyasi and he'd left home. And it was very heartbreaking for Mother Sachi that her oldest son secretly disappeared from the home and went off to become a renunciant. All the women are now they are all sympathizing. You see, they, for women this is not a very nice thing. Think, why why a son should do that? The son should stay at home. Just be a normal person. So, Mother Sachi and Jagannath Mishra, they were concerned that maybe Nimai, maybe the young son, will also be like the big brother. Maybe he'll follow his big brother and also go away from home. So, Father decided we won't send our son to school anymore. We won't educate him. Because if he gets education, you understand the nature of this material world. You know, this is Dukala Yam Ashashvita. So better we keep him at home. Let him just stay at home and be ignorant, be uneducated. So then 
and Lord Chaitanya, when he heard he wasn't to go to school anymore, then he started to do all kinds of tricks. And he would go with friends and then go to people's homes and dress up like they put a big blanket over them. They go like a bull in their home. And then they would one day also Lord Chaitanya was sitting on the pot of garbage where all the clay pots were put after they'd been used. Because he had the custom, they'd cook in clay pots, and after the clay pots used, then he'd just throw it away. Just like what they do in Jagannath Puri today. And so at that time, Lord Chaitanya was sitting on the pile of pots where all the broken pots were, which was the garbage area, contaminated area. So Mother Sachi saw her son sitting there, and she said, what are you doing? Why are you sitting there? And Lord Chaitanya said, well, you don't let me get education. How do I know what's, what's pure and what's not pure? Why don't I go to school? <laughs> so, like this. so uh, then the neighbors also complained that, that if you don't send your son to school, it will be very bad. You know, our sons are all going to school. Yes, we know that maybe, you know, maybe... Maybe they, when they grow up, they may leave home, they may take sannyas, but whatever happens, it's the plan of the Lord. We have to accept. You can't deny your child education. So they convinced Mother Sachi that to send them to school, whatever happens, it's the will of the Lord. So Maya, is it the will of the Lord or is it... <laughs> <laughs> Because it was Krishna's mercy, Prabhu, you know, I'm in my... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Maharaj, I have a question also. Since we are talking about uh, Maya, I am a new devotee. Yeah. I am uh, trying to, I mean, I have been advised to do rounds every day. So I am trying my best to do it. But every time I do, I get very distracted. I, keep, I start thinking about things over the day. And I don't know what all things. I mean, maybe whatever I did 15 years back also, it comes to my mind automatically. So is there any way that I could really concentrate on, on chanting? chanting? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, you have to understand that in chanting Hare Krishna, it's, it's a gradual process. You're not going to get a perfectional stage of chanting immediately. I know you want everything very fast. <laughs> fast food, you know. High speed internet. You know. Everything is very fast, you know. But chanting, it, you know, it, it's a process, you know. And it takes some time. You have to develop it. So there, there are certain things you can do to help to improve your chanting. One is more chant. The more you chant, then the more you will see the effects of the chanting it, uh, become manifest. Another thing you can do is to chant in the association of senior devotees. <coughs> Find a nice environment to do your chanting, a spiritual environment. Because often you may be do, doing your chanting maybe at home. So within your home there are many items, different things there which remind you of family affairs, and different friends and relatives, material connection. It doesn't help you to focus on the chanting. However, if you have a nice temple room in your home or you have a particular place, that may help you may find better there. Bhaktivinoda Thakur himself, he recommends even you can take a blanket and put it over your head. <laughs> Sit under the blanket. But still the mind is there and within your mind you can still contemplate so many things. So, also it's important to try to utilize your, do your chanting at the best time the most auspicious time of the day, which is early morning. There's a period in the day called Brahma Mohurta, which means one and a half hours before sunrise. And in all the religious traditions of the world, they take advantage of that time 
to pray and for, for their spiritual purpose. Here, we hear the Muslim prayers every morning about 5 o'clock. Yeah, we can hear their prayers for early morning prayers. Uh, Buddhists also, uh, sometimes uh, I travel in Buddhist countries, I sometimes have to stay in a Buddhist temple, and they wake up every morning, 4 o'clock, always, there's a gong, they beat the gong, and all the monks immediately get up. Similarly, within our temples, we have our morning program. So, that kind of a day, in the morning, early morning, the mind is more able to concentrate and focus. But we also have to, we have to, cultivate some determination to control the mind. That when the mind does wander to something, you have to bring it back. You know, we have to be we have to be conscious where our mind is going. And when you see the mind starting to wander, you start to contemplate something which is not really nothing to do with Krishna, you should immediately bring the mind back and focus it on the chanting. So loud chanting is recommended. It will help you to concentrate more. And sometimes people ask, what to do with the mind? Prabhupada said, it's nothing to do with the mind. You use the tongue to chant and the ear to hear. You don't need to use it. <laughs> When you use your tongue and your ear properly, you should, I mean, we, we should be concentrating so much on chanting properly and hearing properly that we don't have time to think anything else. You don't have time for any other thing. When we do the chanting correctly, when we use our tongue and ear properly, we don't, we haven't time to think about the mind, to think about other things. But when the mind, when we're not doing these things properly, then, then that's when the mind becomes drawn to these other things, these thoughts, and then you have to kick them out. Now I'm doing my japa. Now you have to talk to your mind. You say, "Listen, mind. You know, do what I tell you. I'm doing my japa now." I don't have time to think about these other things. Try switching off your mobile phone also. When you do your japa, you don't want to have mobile calls in the middle of your japa. You don't, you, you don't want to get disturbed. If you have children, you want to do your chanting when the children are asleep or when they've gone to school. You can't sit and chant when the children are around. That won't be very good. You will find it very good. Because you have to take care of your child. And you have to take care of your husband also. <laughs> you, know, you can't think, oh, I'm going to do my japa now. And your husband comes home from work, he's working all day. And you tell, I'm doing my japa, don't speak to me. <laughs> yeah. Your husband won't like that. So you have to cultivate the, the right mode, the right habits in chanting. Okay, any other points? Everybody's mind is working on the same. Does it take the same effort for everyone to control the mind? Well, of course, not everyone's the same. Yeah, there's according to how they're influenced by the modes of nature. If somebody is very much in the mode of ignorance, they're going to have a much harder time to control their mind. And somebody's in the mode of passion, again, you know, they have that nature. It's not so easy for them to get a grip of their mind. That's why we try to cultivate the, the mode of goodness. We want to associate with the mode of goodness more. Because there the mind is a bit more easier, is a bit 
easier to get the grip over the mind, to control the mind. Uh, if we can cultivate more the goodness, then it's much easier to transcend the material teaching. But if we're way down there in the modes of passion and ignorance, then it's a big struggle. And the mind is full of lust. Like the lust is found in the senses, the mind and the intelligence. So, you definitely want to get rid of these things in order to cultivate control of the mind. So, dealing with the mind, we have to know the mind can be the greatest enemy. For one who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. One who has failed to do so, his mind is the greatest enemy. We can elevate ourselves by the mind, we can degrade ourselves by the mind. It's all, how, we, how do we control the mind? Intelligence is there to control the mind. But intelligence can also become polluted. Krishna said, the lust is in the senses, the mind, and in the intelligence. So our intelligence can also be polluted by lust. How, how to overcome this? We have to take the shelter, we have to take help from the super soul, the Lord in the heart, and from the Vaishnavas, the devotees of the Lord. They can help us. We need their mercy. It's more by hundreds of passion, it's just unfortunate that we have to work harder. But certainly it's unfortunate. Yeah, you will have to work harder. They can also become Krishna conscious, but it's a big jump. <laughs> yeah. Of course, just because someone's in goodness, doesn't mean that it's easier for them to become Krishna conscious because sometimes we see people in the mode of goodness, they're more attached to being in goodness. <laughs> As Prabhupada said, he explains uh, that in, in the mode of goodness we are conditioned to happiness. We're thinking, I'm a good person. <laughs> At least in the mode of passion and ignorance, you can understand more of our suffering. <laughs> so that's an advantage to appreciate that we're suffering. Krishna said, Krishna is the property of those who are akinchana gochara, the materially impoverished. So if one is really helpless, maybe in the mode of passion and ignorance, but it, it can be detached from all, all of these things. But in the mode of goodness, we, we become comfortable there in that mode of goodness. And we think, what's the need to do anymore? I, you know, I'm a good person, I'm a vegetarian, I don't tell any lies, I don't steal, you know, I'm a good person. Why I have to be a devotee? But the problem is that you maybe think you're a good person, but at any time the mode of passion and the mode of ignorance can conquer that mode of goodness. You're not, they're not fixed in the mode of good. So, knowledge of the modes of nature is certainly something which people can benefit from. That they can read the Bhagavad Gita, hear about these things. But then also, even though we may tell them, who will, who will accept it? Just like one lady came, she was, her son had become a sannyasi. With the Chudananda Swami's mother. And she came to see Prabhupada. And that day it was very hot. And she said, Oh, it's so hot here, so hot, Swami. And Prabhupada said, Yes, material world is suffering, it's all suffering here. And so immediately she said, No, no, I don't think it's suffering. I think this world is okay. And Prabhupada, you were just saying it's so hot. <laughs> now you say it's okay. This is a problem with people, that they don't like to admit their suffering. But when they're in Maya, yeah, sometimes, sometimes they won't admit something. You know? if, but if, if they 
Sometimes people go, okay, I'm in Maya, what can I do about it? You know, they, don't it. they don't want to do anything. Even they know what they have to do. They, they won't do it. So they, they're very unfortunate. But when they ask, what can I do? Just like Sanatana Goswami when he met Lord Chaitanya.